If you ask me, I mean, it seems like a pretty reasonable request. After all, I've asked Jesus to do the same thing, and I would bet many of you have as well. Because it's not like this is easy, right? This whole being a follower of Jesus thing. I mean, it doesn't matter if you were a first century follower of Jesus, if you are a 21st century one, none of this is easy. In fact, sometimes it seems like Jesus is making it hard on purpose, right? Asking us things that seem borderline impossible, things that just don't seem to fit with the normal ways that the world works. So when we hear the disciples in our gospel story yell out to Jesus in desperation, Jesus, increase our faith. We're like, yes, exactly. Please, Jesus, increase our faith. I mean, can't you see that we need all the help that we can get out here, right? And really, at least from my perspective, I think it's understandable that the disciples felt that way. I mean, after all, Jesus had been pushing them pretty hard in the chapters leading up to our gospel story today. I mean, really, ever since the end of Luke chapter 9, when Jesus turns and and sets his face to go to Jerusalem, he's moving intentionally into the hands of those who would kill him. And he knows this. And he knows what's at stake. And so he really starts picking up the intensity, the intensity of his actions and the intensity of his teachings as well. He says to his followers, the disciples, he says, you know, you can't serve this kingdom of the world with what it represents and what its values are. You can't serve that world and at the same time serve the kingdom of God. You just can't. And he says to them, he goes on from there, he says, you know, when things are going to get hard for you all, but still, you better not mess this up, all right? It would be better for a big stone to be hung around your neck and you drop down into the sea than for you to stumble, or even worse, to cause someone else to stumble. Oh, by the way, if someone sins, no matter what they do, no matter what they say and do, even if it's seven times in a day, you have to turn back to them. You have to forgive them. That's what he's been teaching. And so that's not easy stuff, right? And the disciples are probably totally freaked out by this. And so it's no wonder that they cry out to Jesus the way they do. Jesus, increase our faith. I mean, they know they're going to need as much faith as they can possibly get. And considering that these same teachings, these same expectations are the ones that Jesus also has for us, we modern day followers, well then it's no wonder that we feel the same way too. In fact, it can be pretty easy sometimes to to feel a bit overwhelmed by the demands that being a follower of Jesus places on us. We wonder, you know, what did we sign up for here, right? We wonder if we have what it takes. So like the disciples, in a panic, we cry out to Jesus, increase our faith. And what does Jesus Now, this is the same Jesus who says he will always be there for us, the same Jesus that says he loves us no matter what. You know, what does he say to us in response? Well, he says no. That's right. He says no. But why? I think one of the reasons... It's because Jesus wants his followers to know that they don't need more faith because what they need is already inside of them. If you had the faith of a mustard seed, Jesus says to his disciples, and in the Greek it's clear he's saying, you know, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, and you do, then even that tiny bit of authentic faith which you already have inside of you is more powerful than you could ever possibly imagine. Don't you understand, he's saying to them and us, that you have all you need. You have faith, plenty of it already in you. And it isn't about proportion. I mean, there's no recipe to follow here. You know, you can't increase faith like that. You have faith, he says, because you have me. You have faith because it's been given to you as a free gift. 
Now, I'm no math genius. I know you find that surprising, actually. In our house, I'm definitely not the one my kids come to for help with math homework, okay? Except for maybe Ezra. I'm still holding on to, barely holding on to second grade math at this point. So no, I'm no expert on math, but, but when I hear this, these words of Jesus, I, I wonder, what if Jesus is saying that faith isn't quantifiable? I mean, what if faith can't be measured or, or increased in some mathematical way like that, right? I mean, in our lives, in our world, we're so used to thinking that more is always better, right? More is better. But what if more faith isn't better faith? In fact, what if faith isn't even a noun? I mean, what if instead faith, faith is, faith is engagement? Faith is orientation. Faith is action. Faith is doing. Faith is something we do, and not something we have, which seems to be the true, at least biblically, if you look. Now, whenever I read through the stories of the Gospels, you know, I'm struck by how often and how lavishly, really, Jesus commends the faith of those who seek him out. Your faith has saved you. He tells a woman who came and, and, and crawled up to him and anointed his feet. Your faith has saved you, he says, to a Samaritan leper who is the only one who returns to thank him. He says the same thing. Your faith has saved you to a hemorrhaging woman who again comes to him, grabs for his cloak. Such faith I have not seen in all of Israel, he says to the Roman centurion who turns to him and cries out. And so what is it about, what is it about Jesus? What is it about how, what he admires in these people? I mean, well, as far as I can tell, the only thing they really do is they turn to him. They orient themselves in his direction. They, they go to him. They, they trust him. What earns his admiration is their willingness. I mean, their willingness, even in, in difficult, painful, and even potentially risky circumstances, to do something and to lean into his goodness and his healing and his mercy. And we're to do the same and we have this faith that is already in us. As I said, given to us as a free gift from God. And we can't increase that faith with some math equation. But we can, and we are called to do something with it. To lean into it. To, to use it. And the truth is, it's that way right there. That is how we end up making it stronger. You know, I've been hard enough on my body over the years that I have been through physical therapy quite a few times at this point, right? And you know it's bad when you walk through the door of the physical therapy office and everyone recognizes you, right? Like, hey, David, welcome back. You know, it's like that old TV show, Cheers, where everyone yells Norm's name when he walks into the bar. That's basically how it is when I go back Checking to PT. Mic, test one, two, three. Someone's testing their mic right now in the middle of my sermon, but <laughs> that's okay. So my most recent stint with physical therapy was a few years ago, a couple of years ago after my latest knee surgery. Now, if you've had surgery and you know, you know, you've gone to PT for it, you know how this all works, right? Well, so after my knee surgery, I wasn't able to do anything for a while. You know, I had to, to wait to start PT until I'd healed up for a bit. And so by the time I got there, I was already very weak from not using any of the muscles around my knee. And the first few times I went, you know, it was totally brutal. I mean, I have one of those PTs who I swear gets some sort of strange, twisted enjoyment out of making me suffer, right, if you've been there. And it wasn't long before I got reacquainted with my old nemesis, what I called the stairway to heaven, if you know, which is basically just a set of stairs that you have in the middle of the room, that go nowhere. Just five steps. You have to walk up them and down them, back and over and over again, just to throw a little psychological torture in there, right, on top of the physical. And, you know, because I was starting out early in the process, you know, I had no strength in my knee. I mean, the muscles had, had atrophied. 
And I was so weak, I couldn't do any of the balance exercises or even lift my leg at the knee with any slight pressure on it. But I kept at it. Four times a week, more exercises at home, day after day, week after week, exercise after exercise. It was hard, and honestly, it was really boring. But I would work my leg muscles over and over, and and slowly, finally... I could begin to see the changes. The muscles were coming back. I started to regain some strength, some balance. Eventually, I was strong enough to be as active as ever. Now, if we're being honest, we would admit that usually when we ask God to increase our faith, what we're really asking God for is to give us what we need so that we can have a spiritual life that's pretty easy. That's smooth sailing. That's uncomplicated. Which sounds good, really. It sounds good in theory. But in practice, I mean, what kind of faith life would we truly have if it really was any of those things? And so maybe, just maybe, the other reason that Jesus is telling us no this morning, we ask for more faith, is because he knows that that wouldn't be the best thing for us. In other words, Jesus doesn't sidestep the disciples and our request for more faith just out of callousness or like my physical therapist because he just likes, thinks it's entertaining to see us suffer, right? No. No, he sidesteps the question. He tells us no out of wisdom and out of a very, very deep love for us. Why? Well, because he recognizes that muscular living, our hearts and our minds, they need that. They require that in order to thrive, to, to grow, to get stronger. I mean, Jesus' response suggests that far from helping us to avoid difficulty, faith actually requires work, rigor, difficulty. I mean, faith, faith isn't an idea. Faith is a muscle, Right? And like any muscle, it grows stronger when it's exercised. And the flip side is true as well. It weakens when it sits idle. Day by day, week by week, moment, little moment by little moment, using it, doing it, living it, that's what makes it stronger. And you know, really, I see this play out in in people's lives all the time. Now, don't hear me wrong right here. I mean, this is not some easy equation that's always going to work perfectly. I mean, someone may come to church all the time and still struggle greatly with their faith, and that is totally understandable. That is totally okay. I mean, this is and will always be a place for those who struggle, who, who doubt, who maybe even feel as if they have no faith at all right now. But if you do have a genuine desire to feel your faith grow and become stronger, well, the best way to do that is by putting it into action. Because maybe not always, but it is often the case that I've seen that the more you worship, the more you partake of the Eucharist, the stronger your faith will grow. The more you go to faith formation classes or journey groups, the stronger your faith will grow. The more you serve others, in this building or, or somewhere outside of it, the stronger your faith will grow. And the more you give of your time, your energy, your money, the more invested you'll be, and the stronger your faith will grow. And the alternative, the alternative is to sit by and do nothing, try nothing, Risk nothing, give nothing, do nothing. The alternative is to to live lives distracted and worried about the priorities of this worldly kingdom, which are so easily easy to pull us away, and not the, the priorities that Jesus teaches. And when we do that, get pulled away, we will feel that weakness begin to take over. 
We'll feel our faith slipping further and, and further away from us until we give it no attention or we give it no effort at all. And it's easier, it's easier than we think to be lulled to sleep and lulled into that trap. G.K. Chesterton put it well when he said once that, he said, the Christian idea has not been tried and found wanting, right? It's been tried, it's been found difficult, and left untried. The Christian idea has not been tried and found wanting, it's been found difficult and left untried. It is an odd thing to embrace something, to to live something you know will make your life harder and not easier. I mean, don't worry, I get that. I understand that that is a a strange thing. I mean, that's definitely not the kind of message that's going to bring hundreds of people rushing to Eric's house for the next rector's reception, right? Wanting anxiously to join a church that talks about stuff like this and and believes stuff like this, but it it is an honest message, and it's a faithful message. And you know, the longer that I serve in ministry, the more I am realizing how that is so much more important than math and numbers. And ultimately, you know, this is what we do because this is who we are. And it's as simple as that. So go, live, do, exercise that muscle knowing that we already have in each of us what we need to do the hard work being asked. And our reward? Our reward is this life itself. As we become the very human beings that we were created by God to always be. Amen.